back to tell you about this week's story of Joseph. We're nearing the end of Joseph's story. Up until now, it has been about when life gets tough and we go through hard things. We turned on the corner in last week. We saw that Joseph became a massive success, but he didn't allow that success to get in the way of God's plan and his purpose in his life. However, sometimes things happen and we just don't know why. It is easy to ask questions and sometimes it seems like we never get answers. But the Bible tells us that God is working all things out for good. That includes the good things and the bad. And since we believe that God always tells the truth, that means that everything that happens in our lives has a purpose. And there is always a reason. This week, we will continue our series on Joseph by talking about when bad people or even the devil wants bad things to happen to us. God turns things around and makes sure all things happen according to his plan. Now, let's hear from Pastor Rick on the life of Joseph. Good morning. So we are in week seven, if you've been keeping score, of uh, our series on Joseph. And this week, we're going to kind of finish up the series. Uh, Next week, we're going to take a a few minutes and and sort of recap some of the highlights. But today, we are going to get where it is we're going. And I think that that's important. It's always important to know where you're going. Yesterday, Joy and I uh, we were, I guess, making our annual or our weekly trip now to Hy-Vee. Since I mentioned last week I hated to go to Hy-Vee on a Saturday, we were yet in the parking lot once again in Hy-Vee where I buy all my groceries, where I get my prescriptions and my gas. For those who were worried, uh, perhaps I, I don't like Hy-Vee. We were in the parking lot, my wife and I. Joy said, I have to go to Walgreens. Now, we were at Hy-Vee. What can't you get at Hy-Vee? Everything. She said, I need to go to Walgreens. I said, which one? Because there are two in Ankeny. And she said, I want to go to Walgreens in Ankeny. We were sitting at the Prairie Trail Hy-Vee, which is at the south and the west end of Ankeny. So Ankeny is both north and east, right? And I said, which one would you like to go to? And she got frustrated. She said, the Ankeny Walgreens. And I said, there are two. Which one would you like to go to? Now, we were facing this direction. This is Ankeny. This is Ankeny. This is Ankeny. And Joy said, that one. And she pointed straight west. And I said to my wife, I should have just said, okay, and just started driving to one. I said, there is no Walgreens in Ankeny that direction. That's West Des Moines. Now that made her upset. She goes, you know what I mean. You know where we're going. You know which Walgreens I need to go to. Now, maybe I did. Maybe I was just being a little bit cantankerous. Maybe I was wanting to, to just sort of cause a little trouble there in our marriage, a little, a little riff. But the reality of it is, it's always good to know where you're going. And it's always good to know how to get there. And I told you seven weeks ago, we were going to arrive somewhere that would be worth getting to much better than the Walgreens in Ankeny. Today, we're going to arrive at the statement, the title statement, the verse that sums up the entire Joseph story. The point of our seven week series of the many chapters given to this story in the book of Genesis And today I'm going to challenge you to have wisdom like Jesus, to check our attitudes. Because if so, everything in your life may begin to make sense. For the last time, I want to remind you from the book of Romans what the Apostle Paul has to say about the Old Testament. And the Old Testament, in this particular passage, where he tells us that the Old Testament is good for a number of things and that we look at the Old Testament in this book of Romans, uh, that it provides encouragement and gives us hope as we learn about our faith. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we may have hope. So we look at this story from Joseph and it gives us two things. Number one, it gives us encouragement that a faithful life, a life lived, making the choice to have uncommon obedience or uncommon faith, well, it makes a difference, not just in our lives, but in the lives of the people around us. That the endurance, the perseverance of faith, it matters, it makes a difference. And it gives us hope knowing that God is paying attention, that he's in control, and that what we're doing, well, it's significant. Now, we have a lot of ground to cover today, many chapters in the book of Genesis, and and, uh, there's too many for me to remind you all of the things that have happened in Joseph's life so far, but suffice to say, there's been a lot. There's been a number of ups, a number of downs. There's been some disappointments, some great times of encouragement and reward, but most recently, Joseph's brothers found themselves in a time of famine, and they traveled to Egypt to beg for food. When they arrived in Egypt, Joseph recognized his brothers, but his brothers didn't recognize Joseph. 
They asked him for food and Joseph said, of course, yes. He went through a game with them, kind of toying about their family, wanting to find out if his father was still alive, if his brother, the um, true brother, his true brother of his mother, of his dad's favorite wife, if he was still alive, Benjamin. Finding out that these things were true, he played some more chess pieces in this game and, and ultimately kept one of the brothers in prison, in confinement. Sent all of the boys back home to their dad, to Canaan, to collect their youngest brother and to come back again for some resources, for some more, some more grain, some more money. He wanted to meet Benjamin, so the boys took off. They went back home. They told their dad, good news, bad news. We found some favor with the prime minister of Egypt, but he is um, wanting to meet our brother. And the dad, he's like, I'm not giving you my brother, or Benjamin, your brother, because I don't want to lose him. I've already lost Joseph. It's too painful. Not going to happen. And they said, you've got to send Benjamin. If you don't send him, then the king will never see us again. Our other brother who's being held in confinement, he'll be lost. So finally, the dad gave up. And he said, if... Benjamin's gone. If the prime minister of Egypt chooses to kill all of you, so be it. We're going to die if we don't go and get more grain anyway. And so he sent the boys back. Now, you know, they had an issue with the silver stashed in the bags last week. We talked about that. The boys go back. Joseph sees the boys. He's so excited. They're men by this time. He invites them into his home for a banquet. The Bible's very particular, very specific, talking about how the Egyptians in Joseph's home wouldn't eat with the Hebrews because they detested them. So Joseph ate separately from his brothers who ate separately from the other Egyptians. And, and they had some conversation and, and things were pretty good. And, and so Joseph decided to send them back home uh, yet again. And when he sent them back home, he had this plot, this uh, even... Uh, maybe a scheme. He planted some evidence, planted this silver chalice in Benjamin's bag and, and gave them all back the silver, which I can't think they kind of expected by this point, and sent them off back to, to Canaan. But Joseph said to his right-hand man, I want you to go track my brothers down, and I want you to stop them as soon as they leave the lands of Egypt. And I want you to find this silver chalice that I've planted in Benjamin's bag, and I want you to bring them back to me. He wanted to freak them out. He wanted to get their attention. So sure enough, Joseph's right-hand man followed the brothers as soon as they crossed the borderlands. He stopped them, and they said, there's no way we've stolen Joseph's silver chalice. We wouldn't do something like that. And the servant said, okay, well, let's see. And they said, look, you can look in our bags. We don't care. As a matter of fact, if you find any stolen silver chalice in our bags, the person who stole it should die. The rest of us will be your slaves. So he started with the oldest, checked Reuben's bag. He was fine. Reuben, see, I told you so. There's nothing in my bag. We don't steal from prime ministers and whatnot. All the way down the list of brothers to Benjamin. When they open Benjamin's bag, they see the silver chalice in Benjamin's bag. All of them surprised, looking at Benjamin. What did you do? Did you steal this? Knowing, of course, he didn't steal it. So they were brought once again before Joseph. And the, the servant had said, why in the world would you repay all the good we've done with evil? And they swore that they didn't. And so Joseph had decided at that point that there had to be payment for this sin. Now, he had schemed all of this and he knew what was going on. He was making a point. But he was letting the drama build. He was bringing his brothers to a point, a decision point. He was trying to find out who they were as men, as a people, and he was letting this moment linger. Now, we're going to pick this up in just a minute. You'll hear the narration of Genesis 44, which talks a little bit about this, um, this action, kind of where I've left it with you and sort of retelling the story. But I want to give you a little bit of context, and I want to remind you that wisdom is the key to understanding life from God's point of view or God's perspective. And Joseph had gained a wisdom. And Joseph's wisdom had come from understanding or believing that God, in fact, has a point and that all of the things in life, the good things and the bad things, can be worked together for good. So let's look very quickly at Romans 8. At Romans 8, a passage of scripture that has been used in tremendous ways of encouragement in ministry and sometimes in ways that are patronizing and, and painful and hard to hear. But it's one of the most powerful truths in all of the New Testament. And if understood in its context, it's not only encouraging, but it's empowering. The Apostle Paul says, and we know 
that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, this is why you should care about this passage, because there are things in your life, just like things in Joseph's life, that have happened to you. There have been good things and there have been bad things. There have been things that seem random and things that seem intentional. And one of the things that you and I struggle with the most is seeing the bad things and seeing the good things, those things that look intentional and those things that look coincidental, and believing that there is a divine plan, that there's somebody paying attention, that there's a difference that our lives are going to make. And so the Apostle Paul is reminding us, just like Joseph knew and we learn from looking at his life, that regardless of circumstance, that God is working all things, both good things and bad things together, for what's ultimately good. Let's look very quickly at this passage and break it down. The Bible says, and we know, which literally means we can know or we can choose to know that in all things God works. Now the word that is used here, the idea, is the same word that you and I get for synergy or use for synergy, which is a great word. Entropy would be the opposite of synergy and entropy is things that break down over time, things that when mixed together break down over time, things that deteriorate. Synergy is the opposite. Synergy literally means you take one thing, one event, and add it to another thing or another event, and you mix those two things together, and those two things together may be different than they were individually, and they become something more significant or meaningful, something better, after being mixed together and time has been added because there's somebody paying attention and bringing about a divine plan. So God takes the things in your life that are good and he takes the things in your life that are bad or difficult and he takes those things even though individually they may be bad or good, mixes them together according to his divine plan, adds a little time and it becomes something far greater, something more significant. And the only way we knew that God was doing that in the life of Joseph is we get to see the end of Joseph's story but you haven't seen the end of yours yet. So maybe you identify with Joseph, but maybe you identify with the Joseph in the pit. Maybe you identify with the forgotten Joseph in prison, or maybe you identify with the Joseph who's finally arrived, who's in a position to provide, a position of responsibility for and with the people who God's put around him. But we have the benefit of being able to look back at the story of Joseph and to see all of the events in his life that look random, the good things and the really bad and the really difficult things, and know that God worked each of these things together and something great came from it. So now we're going to listen to Genesis 44, and I want you to listen carefully, and then I'll come back and explain a little bit about Genesis 44 I'll catch you up in the story, and we're going to see this this statement, this verse, this phrase at the very end of the life of Joseph that ties it all together. The most powerful summarizing point, maybe in any story in the entire Old Testament. Genesis chapter 44. Joseph ordered his house steward, fill the men's bags with food, all they can carry, and replace each one's money at the top of the bag. Then put my chalice, my silver chalice, in the top of the bag of the youngest, along with the money for his food. He did as Joseph ordered. At break of day, the men were sent off with their donkeys. They were barely out of the city when Joseph ran to his house steward. Run after them. When you catch up with them, say, Why did you pay me back evil for good? This is the chalice of my master. This is outrageous. He caught up with them and repeated all this word for word. They said, What is my master talking about? We would never do anything like that. The money we found in our bags earlier, we brought back all the way from Canaan. Do you think we'd turn right around and steal it back from your master? If that chalice is found on any of us, he'll die, and the rest of us will be your master's slaves. The steward said, Very well then, but we won't go that far. Whoever is found with the chalice will be my slave. The rest of you can go free. They outdid each other in putting their bags on the ground and opening them up for inspection. The stewards searched their bags, going from oldest to youngest. The chalice showed up in Benjamin's bag. They ripped their clothes in despair, loaded up their donkeys, and went back to the city. Joseph was still at home when Jude and his brothers got back. They threw themselves down on the ground in front of him. Joseph accused them. 
How can you have done this? You have to know that a man in my position would have discovered this. Judah, as the spokesman for the brothers, said, What can we say, Master? How can we prove our innocence? God is behind this, exposing how bad we are. We stand guilty before you and ready to be your slaves. We're all in this together, the rest of us as guilty as the one with the chalice. I'll never do that to you, said Joseph. Only the one involved with the chalice will be my slave. The rest of you are free to go back to your father. Judah came forward. He said, Please, master, can I just say one thing to you? Don't get angry. Don't think I'm presumptuous. You're the same as Pharaoh as far as I'm concerned. You, master, asked us, do we have a father and a brother? And we answered honestly, we have a father who is old and a younger brother who was born to him in his old age. His brother is dead, and he is the only son left from that mother, and his father loves him more than anything. Then you told us, bring him down here so I can see him. We told you, Master, it was impossible. The boy can't leave his father. If he leaves, his father will die. And then you said, if your youngest brother doesn't come with you, you won't be allowed to see me. When we returned to our father, we told him everything you said to us. So our father said, go back and buy some more food. We told him flatly, we can't. The only way we can go back is if our youngest brother is with us. We aren't allowed to even see the man if our younger brother doesn't come with us. Your servant, my father, told us, You know very well that my wife gave me two sons. One turned up missing. I've concluded he'd been ripped to pieces. I've never seen him since. If you go now and take this one and something bad happens to him, you'll put my old, gray, grieving head in the grave for sure. And now, can't you see that I show up before your servant, my father, without this boy? He'll die on the spot. And we, your servants, who are standing here before you, will have killed him. And that's not all. I got my father to release the boy to show him to you by promising, if I don't bring him back, I'll stand condemned before you. So let me stay here as your slave, not this boy. Let the boy go back with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? Oh, don't make me go back and watch my father die in grief. Let me pray for you as we turn the corner here. Father, as we continue to look at this story, I pray for my friends who are trying to make sense of the things that are going on in their lives, that perhaps struggling to decide whether you're trustworthy, to, to perhaps even make the decision to live the life of uncommon faith. And I pray that you would speak to us right now, that you would teach us this truth, and that you'd give us the courage to follow through. In Jesus' name. So as we look at this part of the story, I want to point your attention to something or a person who you may have forgotten about, you may not have really paid a lot of attention to, and this person is Judah. And Judah, we find him here in front of Joseph, and he's begging his brother for the life of Benjamin. And you may not think that that's significant because, um, you know, after all, wouldn't anybody beg for their brother's life? But this is the same person, Judah, who back in the day when they decided to kidnap and beat up Joseph to leave him for dead. It was Judah who decided, hey, instead of killing him, let's make some money off of him. Let's go ahead and, and uh, sell him to, to Egypt and, and at least we'll make some profit in his death or his life you know, won't be a complete waste. A person who wasn't always a good guy. And you say, well, that probably wasn't enough to convince me he wasn't a good guy. I would suggest that there's more to convince you that he wasn't a good guy. In the beginning part of this story, there's an entire section of scripture that talks about Judah and talks about Judah's lack of discretion, some choices that he makes. And I wanna tell you about them real quickly to let you understand one important point. And that point is that the person somebody becomes does not have to be based off of the person that person used to be. That a person can become somebody different, that you can change, that you can grow. You can leave your past behind. The Bible says that Judah took off to a land that he probably shouldn't have been in, saw a woman he shouldn't have been with, but he liked her, and so he married her. He had three sons with her. The first son was detestable to God, and so God killed him. It was an Old Testament thing. I don't know exactly why or what happened. It just did. But there was a wife that this oldest son had, and the wife had to be taken care of. Her name was Tamar or Tamar. And so Judah said to his second son, to the middle son, I want you to take care of your older brother's wife and I want you to be with her and have children. And the Bible says that the second son didn't really want to do it because he knew they wouldn't really be his kids. And so he did some things that you need to read for yourself to believe that they're actually in the Bible. And it was detestable to God. And so God killed him. 
And then the Bible says that this woman, Tamer, she didn't have anybody to be with if the youngest brother wasn't old enough to get married. So she waited around in mourning until the youngest brother was finally old enough to marry. And apparently he didn't want to marry her and, and Judah didn't want to, to give her to him. And so the Bible says that she decided to trap Judah. And so instead of mourning in her clothes and veil that she was wearing, she dressed like a prostitute and went out and hung out by the gate of the city because she knew that Judah was coming. So when Judah walked into the city, apparently he sees this random woman who he didn't recognize, who was dressed like a prostitute. And he's like, hey, let's get together. Let's hook up. And she's like, yeah, sure, sounds good. What are you gonna pay me? And he said, how about a goat? And she said, sure, a goat, that works. And they made a deal. And so the Bible says that they went and they hooked up. And she goes, pay me. And he said, well, I don't have the goat with me. And she's like, well, leave my driver's license, your driver's license or your Amex card and then go get the goat and come back and pay me later. And so he gave her the seal of his family and the sign of his authority and he left it with her thinking that she was a prostitute. And I'm going, what in the world is this guy thinking? You don't do that in any society, in any world. And so he goes back and sends the goat with his buddy to pay off the prostitute who wasn't really a prostitute, it was his daughter-in-law. And she's gone, so he asked the guys, where's the prostitute that hangs out here? And they said, there's no prostitute who hangs out here. So a few months later, word comes to Judah. Tamer's pregnant. She's been prostituting. And he goes, well, bring her to me so we might burn her. And then she says, I'm pregnant by the man who bears this sign, this seal. And she shows the things that Judah had given. I mean, messed up. The guy had some issues. I say that to say that this is the same man that years later is standing before Joseph, begging for his brother's life and begging on behalf of his father, who before cared nothing for his father and cared nothing for his brother, who's begging, saying, my dad can't handle the grief if you take Benjamin and imprison Benjamin or kill him. He doesn't deserve the grief. Benjamin doesn't deserve to do this. Take me instead, offering himself in the place standing up not just as a brother but as a man doing the right thing and i was reminded as i'm working through this story that oftentimes the difficult things that you and i go through in our lives i want you to track with me on this oftentimes some of the difficult things that you and i go through in our lives aren't for us they're for the people around us that God was using circumstances and events in Joseph's life that were good and were bad. And Joseph wasn't the only point. That God was working in somebody like Judah, who ultimately was responsible for the line of Jesus. That God was working in Joseph's life to impact the world around him. And that the good and the bad things that God is synergistically working together in your life may not be all about you. That it may be for your husband or your wife. It may be for your kids, for your family, for the people you work with or around. You may not be the center of the story, that you might not even be the point. But living your life this way gives you significance that ripples far beyond what we know. And if you follow along in this story, you see that Joseph, as random as his life looked at times, well, it had a meaning and a purpose that I want for each of us. So the story continues. Joseph reveals himself. You gotta read it for yourself, I'm telling you. You can read it through on BibleGateway.com if you don't have a copy of the Bible or you don't have an app downloaded to your phone. Any translation that you like, I like the NIV translation. It's the one I, I preach out of. You've got to read this story. I mean, it is so good and I'm skipping so much. But here's what happens. Um, the, Joseph tells his brothers, ta-da, it's me, Joseph, and they don't believe him and then they're afraid of him and he says, don't be afraid, go get your dad. So they go and they get their dad. Their dad doesn't believe him. Go, there's no way Joseph's in charge of Egypt and their dad's like, I guess we'll go because Joseph sent all kinds of female donkeys and male donkeys full of, of souvenirs and supplies from Egypt. And so all the family, the Bible says that there were about 66 went back and they lived in Egypt. That Pharaoh honored them 
that they took care of them. And that as Joseph's dad got old, got ready to die, he called the brothers to him and gave them each blessings and in some cases curses. Now we know that the tribes of Israel came from these brothers. There's tremendous history after the Exodus. A lot of things happened that were so, I mean, it all started. This is like ground zero. So this old man and his dying breath musters up the energy to sit up in bed, swings his feet over the edge, calls his boys to him. Reuben, the oldest, finally gets what he deserves. For remember going upstairs to his dad's couch and sleeping with his dad's concubine way back in the day. He gets kind of a curse. Judah, tremendous blessing. The rest of the boys, somewhere in between. Their father was telling them the personality that they would take on and the people that they would lead, giving them sort of a foreshadowing as God had, had instructed him. And then the Bible, just in an understated but beautiful way, said the old man curled his legs up underneath him and breathed his last. So Joseph said to Pharaoh, my dad made me promise to take him to Canaan to bury him. Can I do that? And Pharaoh said, of course you can. Go. So Joseph went with his brothers, with the people who were close to Joseph. It was a large undertaking. They went and they buried their father in Canaan. The brothers got worried because their dad was gone. And they suspected that their dad was the only thing standing between them and Joseph taking their heads off. So they began to conspire together. They came up with a lie to try to protect themselves, feeling like that the end of the story was going to be Joseph's final judgment. Revenge meted out, heads lopped off, end of story, descendants gone, done. Here's where we pick it up. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you're to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they've committed in treating you so badly. Did he say that or not? Uh, you know, we don't know. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God, your father, of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before Joseph. And they said once again, for about the third or fourth time, we are your slaves. Now here it is. Here is the statement, the verse that sums up the entire story. Friends, it sums up your life and mine. It sums up in a very descriptive and powerful and concise way, the life of uncommon faith. Here it is, you probably heard it before, but Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. I am not God. You're not either. Joseph said, do not be afraid. And he didn't say, you don't have anything to be afraid of. He said, you don't need to be afraid because I am not going to presume to put myself in God's place. I will not decide what you deserve. I've learned in my years that there's some things that are above my pay grade and I am not God. I don't know that any of us would say we're God, but I think many of us play like we are God. And so Joseph simply says, don't be afraid. I'm not God, and I'm not going to sit in his seat. You intended to harm me. He doesn't let him off the hook. He doesn't pat him on the back. He calls him evil or the, at least the actions that they did years ago. He calls it like he sees it. And he said, I know what you intended. I know you intended to harm me. I know what you did was wrong. I know what you did. Well, it should be punished, but I'm not God. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Years and years and years before the New Testament was ever written, 
God was up to his synergy, working things together, the good things and the bad things, the things that seem random, the things that seem circumstantial, and making something intrinsically, morally, spiritually good. And it wasn't just good for Joseph, it was good for the time and the place and the circumstance that God had put him in. And Joseph had learned, I'm not the center of the story. I'm not the point. He developed a humble spirit and a soft heart. He learned an accountability about his life, knowing that he lived with and for others and not just for himself. He had an integrity about him where he was trustworthy. You could count on him. And he sums it up, and he says, you intended to do me wrong, but God intended it for good, and he accomplished what's being done right now. And in his context, it's the saving of so many lives. So what's that look like for us? Well, let's see if we can apply this together in our last few minutes. A person who simply reacts to the ups and downs of life allows people and circumstances to make them bitter, hard-hearted, and pessimistic. Stop. How many people do you know who are bitter, hard-hearted, and pessimistic? Are you moving toward people or away from people? Are you creating joy in people's lives or are you bringing the opposite of joy, despair? Are you an agent of healing in relationship and circumstance? Or do you make things worse? I'm ashamed to say that many Christians are known for this bitter, hard-hearted, pessimistic spirits that are just shameful to God. And there is no one on the face of the earth who should be more the opposite than somebody who's been saved by grace, only having to offer faith in return and grasping this truth that our life is significant, that the way God sees things makes sense. And even the good and the bad ultimately are being worked together for something far greater than I could ever see or know. Joseph didn't know the end of his story. We do because we get to read it. And friends, you don't get to know the end of your story because it's not over yet. But a Christian who chooses to respond with uncommon faith believes in a divine purpose and a loving God. We allow people in circumstance to make us soft-hearted and optimistic because we know we're part of a plan. Faith in God equals a good attitude toward people and toward circumstances. An attitude is our perspective, the way in which we view the world. When I choose to live by uncommon faith, I trust that where God has put me, the situation that we find ourselves in, I don't know your situation. I wish I did. But I want you to think about it. I trust that my location, my situation, And my companions, the people that God has allowed or chosen for you to be around, that they're good, even though they can be bad. You say, what are you talking about, preacher? They're either good or bad. No, they're not. They're good, even though they can be both good and bad. Because that's the kind of God we serve. God is up to good even though some people may may not be up to good. Some circumstances, well, they may be bad. You follow the point? God is working things together. My attitude makes me useful to God, and it allows me to find God's purpose for my life. Well, I wanna end this with a prayer, and I've done this for a few weeks. Um, it's basic 
And for some of you, it's probably too basic. For some of you, maybe um, it makes you question whether a person should pray like this because it's honest, I think comprehensive, and it's the way I talk to God. I want to remind you that when I talk to God, I don't do it with disrespect because he's God. But I do do it with an open heart, with sincere emotion, and with the commitment not to play games. So I want to read this prayer to you that sums up this excerpt or part of Joseph's life and this part of the message today. And I trust that you'll resonate with it. And if not, I hope you tolerate it. God, sometimes you confuse me. Now, let's stop there. Could you say that to God? Does that make some of you churchies very uncomfortable? God, sometimes you confuse me. He does. God confuses me. Why? I'm not God. But it's okay to say that. God doesn't respond with a startled look on his face. I thought I confused you. Get away from me. You don't have the faith to be my friend. Of course not. He says, I get it. I can be confusing. Let me explain it to you. God, sometimes you confuse me. Now, this is my prayer. You can share it if you want to. Other people confuse me. You ever been confused by somebody else? About the time you think people are predictable? They're not. They're predictably unpredictable. Sometimes they show up when you don't expect them to show up. They do things you don't expect them to do. They say things that you wish they wouldn't say. And sometimes the opposite happens. It's just the way it is. Other people confuse me, God. Circumstances are unpredictable. I hate that part. And I even confuse myself. When I go through hard times, they seem unnecessary, God. Unfair and even random. This probably is the worst. I don't want to be uncomfortable or disappointed. And I hate to admit it, but in my dark moments, I wonder if there's a point. Is this stressing anybody out? I want to look at you under the lights here. It's okay to say that. Because God's like, I know. That's the reason that I gave you so many stories of my faithfulness in the Old Testament. I know. It's the reason I let you see behind the scenes in Joseph's life to watch my hand at work. It's the reason I let you see the end of so many of these men and women of faith to know how their story ends, because I know you can't see how yours ends. In the meantime, he sticks a hand out and he says, do you trust me? So then, I say, but God, I choose to believe you, even though I don't always understand you, because I'm not God. I know that you work out every circumstance for good, and you're playing a long game. And you love me. Don't forget, it's not an afterthought. You, God, have access to information that I don't have. You know things that I can't know. After all, you're God. I want to live with uncommon faith. How do you want to live? I'm unaware of a time, at least in my lifetime, where living a life of genuine, uncommon faith is more important. We need it, but our world around us needs to see Jesus Christ lived out through broken people like you and me with soft hearts and humble spirits, choosing to put ourselves second or even third Realizing that the story is much bigger than ourselves. And that the only way to find this peace, hope, meaning, purpose, is to live for Jesus. 
and to live for him alone. I want us to do that, and I want us to do that together. So as we turn the corner in just a couple weeks to a season of thanksgiving and a season of celebration, I want this last seven weeks to profoundly change the way we live and how we relate to each other. Father, thank you for my 